we touched on the driverless car, now we're going to hear from probably the UK's leading researcher in this area, uh, Paul Newman, uh, VP Professor of Information Engineering from the University of Oxford. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so, I'm not going to make the case that the bugs are important, that's why you're here. I think that case is already made. Uh, I'll talk, I think, instead on foundational technology. Um, something that we are going to see and need at the heart of many of the things we need to do with robots, and indeed technologies that spin off before we get autonomy. So I'd like to talk about that. And it's this. It's infrastructure free navigation mapping and scene understanding. But put simply, hopefully it's on the next slide, Society moves stuff. It's what we do. There's an awful lot of economic activity about moving stuff. It could be something in a shop, it could be a warehouse, it could be a train, it could be a sensor on Mars, it could be something on the water, it could be you in a car, uh, it could be something around a home, uh, it could be a foreman walking around a building site looking at what's going on, it could be looking for potholes, it could be a self driving car or a bus. There's tons of stuff that we move. And if we want to move stuff faster, better, safer, more of it, more of the time, we might want machines to do that. And if we want machines to do that, they've got to know where they are and what's around them in the world. And a huge point, they need to do that without just changing the world. It is nuts to say, let's put a robot in this place, or I've got to change the place because I put the robot in it. That is a nuts economic argument and you should reject it with a laugh. Okay, so we're all about that kind of technology and that kind of technology we think is core and we exploit it in different domains and just one of those domains is hands-free driving. So here you go. This is what I thought would be different to talk about a piece of tech here. Really what's going on. So we call it lifelong infrastructure-free navigation. Um, now we already heard about why lifelong is important, it's because we are not just about conference papers and journal papers, let's grow up. It's going to work, it's going to work a long time, right, so Nick already made this point, and long time means stuff changes, yeah, so one day it's sunny, the next day it's snow, it's got to deal with it. A particular focus I should have said is what we're working on is doing this outdoors, not indoors, yeah, you can do okay indoors, because we're already engineered the place to be pretty stable. Try doing this outdoor with lizards in rain, in wind, at night. It's quite interesting to try and do that. Infrastructure free, because I do not want to depend on anything else in the world. That means I don't really even want to depend on GPS. Why? Because I have to build space rockets to make it work, and put satellites in orbit, and it doesn't work most of the time and can be turned off. So when I say it doesn't work most of the time, it means that if I'm lucky, I'll get a couple of meters of error, as I'm going around the roundabout, and the guy next to you has got a couple of meters there, and this is not going to end well. Okay, and the signal is back to buildings, and it doesn't work indoors, I've got a generic way to do this. Okay, so the AI wants to see a robot. This is an uninteresting robot. Okay, it's one that we built simply to train the graduate students. Now, what's interesting is the information engineering that's happening in here. We've got cameras and lasers, and they're sensing the world in some way, and what really counts is the text file that takes that kind of data and does something useful. It. it is a text file, it is a computer program that is infinitely recordable, has no mass, and the UK should lead it. Okay? Hardware is great, but I think it's the information engineering that really leads, and the pixies behind, who've all gone to Google. Okay, so here you go, here's a piece of the tech that you that might see outdoors. Over here we've got a stereo camera, and what you're seeing here, this is actually a coordinate frame, X, Y, Z, colored in red, green, and blue. And what you're seeing, these little green dots, are I saw something interesting in the left image, and I saw something interesting in the right image, and I can come up with a correspondence, right? So that's like closing your eyes, and you get stereo vision. Great, on one frame. Now, I'm going to do that over multiple frames. So I see the left bit, the right bit, I see a corner, and I'm gonna, so blue line should be here soon, and I'm gonna be able to track these dots over multiple frames. So now I've got a web, I've got left, right correspondence, going forwards over time. If you see green, that means I can track these things left and right over time. One of the things information engineers can do is some mathematics, and we can turn those pictures and say, well, if I'm seeing this thing left and right, and forward over a whole sequence of items, a whole sequence of images, how must this camera have moved in six degrees of freedom? X, Y, Z, roll, pitch, your. 
I can figure out now how this camera's moving with no knowledge of the world at all, simply because the stuff in the world. It doesn't work, you can just put it on a mirror. Okay, but most of the time we're not working on mirrors. Apart from in this angle, they probably should have thought this was really, really sharp, which is embarrassing. But this is the, the kind of idea. So what we've got now, we can run this at 40 hertz in an arbitrary environment. So I can stick it onto my laptop here, take a camera, I can walk through here and tell me how it works. Okay? That's an interesting competency to have because, well, first of all, you can, you, there's a little bit of detail you need to worry about, like what if the stuff in the world is moving? like cars and trucks and stuff. So you've got to be a little bit careful about your mathematics. But there are things that you can do in mathematics that lets it not worry about that and you can still pull out the signal of how you're moving. Okay, so what could we do? Well, we could stick this on a car and stick a laser in its ass, okay? And then have that laser move through space. So now I've got like a jazz dance laser, it's called. Right? It's a vertical laser. So imagine I'm rigidly fixed, my hands are rigidly fixed and then my laser. I've got my eyes. I'm right? figuring out how my head's moving because I've got my stereo system. I'm now moving through the world. I can paint the world with laser light. That might be interesting. What happens if I do that? Well, here you go. He's coming to London. I'm sitting the stereo on a car. Oh, we're just trying. There's no GPS in. Okay? This is a very cheap system. Stick it, and we're driving, and we will be producing really quite nice representations of London. And I think there's a really nice figure here. And the lights out to see this. This is just coming to London Park Club. This is the House of the Parliament driving past it. We just drive now at 30, 40 miles an hour. And this is, we've got a bit of aliasing happening here because of the compression. But we're seeing the light here, you can see. We're getting this texture because we're actually recording them with photons that are coming back. Um, don't try this at home, kids. Don't try and stick a laser on a car with a stereo system and hope to get these maps. Okay, because the devil is in the detail and the detail is really devilish. Okay, you have to really worry about calibration, timing between the sensors. But you can do it. The broad idea you have, I mean, just to give you some sort of sense, if you had a millisecond of a timing error between an image and the camera and the laser, you'll be out by tens of meters. You'll just look a complete mess. You really have to think about this. We're so sensitive with our timing, we can, we can see a weather front coming through and the pressure changing the atmosphere and changing the skew between the clocks and the lasers and the cameras. So we can estimate that kind of stuff to get this kind of detail. That's one of the tricks that we pull. And what we're doing is we, we embed it, thank you very much. They're going to be on, you may as well leave them and on and off all the time because I've got a small report of videos coming up. Um, so, you know, we embed this in a device, a thing called a boom, cameras, and, you know, why, why might that be useful? Why might it be useful to just drive through a city and come up with a 3D representation of it? Well, maybe one of the things you want to do is look for potholes. Okay, so on the right hand side here is a laser image of the world. Now this is not produced with a fancy Velodyne 3D laser. Okay, this is produced with a cheap 2D laser you can get off the shelf. On the right is an image, left is an image as you're looking at it. Yeah, left. And on the right is the 3D constructed view. Now every pixel on the right hand view has X, Y and Z, it has depth. So I can click on a mouse on two places and actually measure the size of something and the depth of it. So one of the things we're thinking of doing is pothole detection as we drive. Okay, well that's a nice, I love this, look at this, check this out. You can see the one on the right is actually in laser light, but you can see, can you see, you can see the road markings as well. But that's actually in laser light. Pretty interesting, if you, if you really worry about that detail, you can do quite a good job on this. All right, so of course, this should start playing. Okay, of course, you can, you can colour it, because what you could do is you could take the laser light, build a 3D model, we're good at knowing where we are, project that laser light back into your camera and colour every pixel. All right, nice trick. Yep, short, so you can get some nice colour on stuff. And look at this, you get the reflections on the side of those cars. That's kind of interesting. Uh, and hopefully, we remove them. Another thing you can do is you can say, well, actually, the cars... I want to go. Okay, so this is all done. We could, this is some machine learning. So what we can do is we can teach the machines what cars look like, give them a big point cloud, and say, I expect there are cars in this city. I don't want them, and they just get removed. So this is this is a thing that we can just we can just run. Alternatively, you could say, I'd like to see where all the cars are, and just pull the cars. Up. So now you can start to think about asset detection and asset management. 
by doing stuff outside. And what the story I'm trying to tell is the fundamental technologies of robotics have lots of application domains. You do not need a closed loop autonomous robot to start making money out of this. You don't. There's enabling technology on the way that becomes useful. Okay, so one of the places you might want to do that is on the railways. So we don't know much about our railways. We don't know where stuff is. It's just if you look at the Indian railway system, really don't know where well, a lot of stuff is. So sending, um, putting our, on a bill on the train and doing asset detection and learning like that is, is, is pretty interesting. Of course, there's warehouse management. You might want to know where your stock is. Before you start having Kiva-like autonomy, there are things you can do before. But of course, we're working on Kiva-like autonomy as well. That's one of the things that we can do. It's want to make a different, a different point. Okay, so let's move to the thing you probably thought I was going to talk about, self-driving cars. Here's one that we built earlier. Um, so we did this in, wait, in 2012, yeah, late 2012, we bought a car from the Ford Corp, and four months later, autonomized it. Um, and so this is the UK's first autonomous car. Um, we can drive it on the road, we work with DMT, it can drive itself on the road in the UK. Uh, the interface is through uh, an iPad, just says go, and one of the models we have is not the Google Moonshot Drive Mint, it's different, the car says I could drive you if you like. So only when the car is able to drive does that opportunity come up. And here's it, here's it driving around. And so one of the things that this car does is it uses those 3D laser maps to navigate. What it does is well, I've gone through Oxford and I've built one of those maps for free. And then it has the camera the laser. We've got four ways to do it. One of the ways to do it is we replay the laser data. So we run the laser again. And it just likes to figure out where it must be in the world. Because if it was in the right place, the statistics it's seeing from the laser light at runtime should match with the statistics of the map that it built earlier. If they don't, you're in the wrong place. So what do we do? We wobble it around until the statistics of now map to the, and are similar to the statistics of where I was a month or so earlier. And that works kind of well. Laser is okay, but it's kind of nice. I think oh, there's a nice video of actually doing that here. Yeah, so the laser's coming out the back. Actually, I'll let this one play. And here it is. This is a map that was recorded earlier, the trajectory, and this is the live feed coming out the back of the car. And it's interesting, we're not doing a horizontal scan, we're not finding the laser horizontal, we're doing it vertically. That's a trick that we find makes a massive difference. It doesn't actually burn the environment. <laughs> and of course, on top of this is all the semantics about what it means to be on the road, for a car, stop signs, that's all stuff that needs to be done and we do. So, someone talked about you know, robustness. Check this out. So, this is uh, doing it indoors in quite different lighting conditions. But this is the kind of thing that we're on to now, is having the vehicle learn to navigate in these changing environments. This is the same place under different weather conditions. And we've just at the moment trying to convince the reviewers to accept a paper where we do this 24 hours a day, outdoors, in the rain, wildly different lighting conditions. Check it out. Dealing in this computer vision, dealing with that is hard. Now, I'm really excited about this because this, I think, is where it's at. This is where I think mobile robotics outdoors is. It's really safe. Dealing with change is not about better software, it's about different ways to think about the problems. The way we solve this, is it costs nothing to remember everything. Yeah, we send the car out and we drive it, human drives it, and suddenly it's rain. We go straight and see rain, none of the navigation works, rain gets recorded, comes back, learns to navigate in rain, and it builds up experience after experience after experience, experience based navigation. And it's transformed what we can do, and we're pretty we're pretty keen on that. Okay. So this is a whistle stop tour. I knew we were going to run out of time, so I'm going to try and catch us up to get a bit more time. I guess we'll talk a bit later. What have you seen here? Yeah, I have shown you a fundamental competency of modern robotics that allows you to go into any place you've never seen before, cheaply go in, drag some sensors around, you know how you move, you get to learn what's in the environment, and you get to leverage that. Maybe for full autonomy for self-driving cars. Maybe for something much more than just understanding what your workspace is like. There is value in knowing what is where and where you are. And um, I would ask you to talk to, to Graham Smith here, who also represents Oxford afterwards, who's looking after, you know, starting to think about some of the exploitation avenues that we have for this at the university. So, interesting to talk to Graham.
key thing. Lifelong, it's going to work forever. Infrastructure free, because that's the economic model. Navigation, because if you don't know where you are and what is where, there's very little that you can do. Thank you very much.